we want to talk about, as you know, there's a lot of people here. I mean, there are people, business people, with a huge amount of compassion because they want to do some good. We have people in the NGO who are actually doing it and living it every day. But I think what would be useful is a lot of you have scaled a lot of things. So what is it that matters? What is it that matters when, you know, what matters changes with the size of the organization, with these, you know, the face of the organization? And how do you bring the discipline? How do you make sure that you know what, what matters and how you count it, and you make that counting into an actionable thing. So you want to get started, Mohan? Uh, thank you, Desh. Let me start with the Akshay Patra story. It's actually a very, very, very interesting story. It happened that uh, in the year 2000, I'd gone to the ISKCON temple in Bangalore to meet, uh, to see the temple. And uh, I'd gone there for a particular reason, because three years ago, three years before that date, I and my wife went to the temple because we heard somebody's building a temple. We went around, saw the construction, and said we want to do something. So we signed up for something called a Sudama Seva, giving five rupees a day. Because you know we didn't have any money, not much money those days. So we gave five rupees a day, and we realized one day that we had not given money for two years. So we said we must go keep a promise. So both of us went, and in the meantime, a friend of mine called up and said, look, I'll get you a meeting with the temple president. So we went to the temple, we walked all around, we couldn't meet him, he was busy, and we we're going out. And suddenly we heard a voice calling out my name. And I looked around and I saw a Swamiji and he said, uh, uh, you know, what are you doing here? I said, I want to meet the temple president. So he took me to him, to Madhu Pandit, who was from IIT Mumbai. And uh, I, thank, I congratulated him on building the temple. I asked him how much money he has raised. He said he's raised 35 crores in Bangalore, <laughs> largely from all the puppies of Bangalore, <laughs> the corrupt officials, corrupt policemen, everybody who wanted to buy peace with the God and the Maker. So <laughs> then I told him, look, you built this wonderful temple, now you must do something for people. He said, what should I do? I said, why don't you start a midday meal program? He said, what is this midday meal program? Then I told him the story of what uh, M.G. Ramchandran had done in Chennai. Uh, MGR became the chief minister of Tamil Nadu at one point of time, and the interesting story. And he was, as a child, he had no food to eat, so he knew what is hunger. Many of us don't know what is hunger. We've never been hungry, so we don't know what is hunger. So the first thing he did was to call all his officials and tell them, I want to make sure that every child is fed a meal by the state. And they came back and said, it can't be done. The World Bank will object. IMF will object. It's a non-planned expenditure. We don't have money. He listened to them for three months, then called all the secretaries of his house for a meal, and they had a good meal. Then he opened the doors of his house, called the street urchins to come. They all came and ate the leftover food. Then he told them that if you don't sign this order by today evening, I will transfer it to Ramnath Puram or some boondock, some crazy place. <laughs> so they all signed. 25 years later, Desh, children were two inches taller, 10 pounds heavier, literacy had gone up, infant mortality had come down, metal mortality had come down, and Tamil Nadu would become a different state. It is a remarkable thing. So I told him, let's start. He said, okay, I don't mind starting, but uh, I want something from you. I said, what? Uh, okay, give me two buses, two vehicles. I said, okay, I'll give you two vehicles. So we started with 1,500 children, and we had no idea what it was. And because he said I could cook here, and then we, we used to meet every week to find out what happens. Then he said, okay, let's do more. We went to 5,000, and suddenly, uh, we went through the processes, and he said, I must set up a kitchen. Then he did some technical work, set up a kitchen, because they give prasadam every single day. It was a large temple, so they had an organization. And many schools came and demanded that we had some money from, uh, from a US foundation who came and told us uh, that, look, we'll give you some money. What will you do? We said, we'll go up to 25,000. And 25,000 is a very big number. So we suddenly reached 25,000 because so much of distress. So we had to cook the food. We had to make sure it's got high quality and distributed, and distributed within five kilometers. So it's not very difficult, so we had 25,000. Then the US Foundation gave us just about $25,000, and they, they got scared. They said, you must put in processes, you must look at design, you must have management, you're big. We said, 25,000 is not big, it's so small. And then they said, we're not gonna give you money. Then we all were scared because we had no money. We used to put money around the place. So we said, we will, what should we do? Should we, should we shut it down and stop or do this process business? And then we said, look, we 
not do it, let us try for 100,000, and so long we had the, the, the hungry child will feed the child. So we started collecting money from friends. We went to the chief minister, said you must start this program. We went to Delhi and got somebody else to help the program. We lobbied with the Chandra Babu Naidu. We lobbied with Muli Manoj Joshi, with Prime Minister Vajpayee's office, those days in 2002. And uh, we made them create a policy for this country. So we had an outreach program. So first we had a small number. And the number went up because we monitored it every week. We put in some kind of rudimentary processes. We had a good team of people. Then we said, you must do some policy work. We went around. And then we started a fund collection drive. And then we got hold of some few donors. And then the government started running the program in Karnataka because we badgered SM Krishna to do it. And then they gave some money. And we asked the government of India to give some money. So the government used to give us two and a half rupees. Then said, we do 100,000. We reach 100,000. Then we went to meet some banks, other institutions, and they came together. Then after 100,000, what did we do? We had 500,000. Why 500,000 is the next big number. All right? Then we got invited to Rajasthan. We got invited to Orissa. We got invited to UP. We went there. We got some donors. It is all a startup without an idea of failure. We didn't have much processes, and we just started doing it, and there were many devotees. They all went there, sat down, and it actually worked. But we used to review every week. We used to push every week. We used to collect money and try to do many things, and many times we had no money. And then, of course, Desh came on the scene, and Desh is a very processed guy. He came and told us, look, I will help you out. Let's set up something in the U.S. He set up his foundation, and he tried to help us, Daksha Patra, there in the U.S. They said he must put up processes. He helped us get some managers, and we had grown to 500,000. And suddenly we got scared. 500,000, and if you miss one single day, what happens? The vehicle breaks down, the kitchen breaks down, the generator doesn't work, there is no power for a day, something goes wrong, and we are scared. And we are supplying food. So we had to make sure the food is very good. I mean, there's no contamination. We used to get somebody from the government to come and taste the food and do all those things and build a brand. And then we hired some people to put in processes. We made uh, line drawings of kitchens because each kitchen cooks 150,000 meals in about six hours. They start at 3 o'clock and finish by uh, maybe about 9 o'clock. Then they have to distribute to about 300 schools. We got one hour for distribution. We run about 3,500 vehicles every single day. And now we distribute within 50 kilometers. So we did 5,000, 500,000. We had no money. And then we said, we reached 5, 500,000. Let's do one, 10 lakhs. And 10 lakhs was the large number. So we went to uh, Modi and we told, told him, and Modi said, come to Ahmedabad. He got together the public sector units and we started doing something. Vasundar Raje in Rajasthan started helping us, gave us land and did everything. And then we set up a marketing team to raise money under Sridhar. Sridhar came and joined us. He was a techie running his own company. He gave it up and he started joining us to raise money. We set up a telemarketing unit. We set up a, uh, you know, an organization to go get funds from everybody. So we had the temple collecting money, the trustees collecting money, they helping us out with management and money. And then we had Sridhar and his team collecting money. The government raised the funds and we reached 10 lakhs. They again met us and told us, you have to have processes. This is not the way to good things. So we stopped growing for two years. So we stopped going for two years, put in more processes, put in management, got ISO standards, refined our kitchen, uh, did operational research to make sure quality improved, the transportation network improved, built in management, the volunteer workforce of the temple was substituted by some small young, young group of people. Sridhar was given charge. For last two years, we didn't grow, but he said by 2000, we'll grow to 50 lakh children. So today, we're feeding about 13 lakh children, and uh, uh, we're going to feed 50 lakh children by 2000. We don't have the money for it. We don't know where you're going to get the money, but we're going to get it. And today we spend 180 crores. So what are the lessons for scaling? The lessons for scaling are you need to have a dedicated team of four or five people who have a big dream. Now, dream can be small, but it can be big at that point of time. Second, you need to review what you do every single week, every single month you need to review. Third, you need to make sure that you advocate uh, what you're doing through policy makers to get the state involved to have to solve a social problem. So you've got to meet people and build a brand and do everything else. And next, you've got to get some few big donors involved and go talk to them. And next, you've got to meet Desh. <laughs> <laughs> you've got to meet Desh and, ask, and hopefully Desh will come around and help you around. And then you've got to build a team. But all the time, you've got to keep pushing, you've got to have a big view, building process. It's like running a business. A startup is a startup is quick and dirty, 
And once it comes to a particular size, you get in processes, you get in management, but you could lose your innovative abilities. So you've got to keep that spirit of being a very large startup, but keep that aim high, the goal high, and please write big checks from your own pocket. <laughs> well, that's an amazing story. So Stu, you've uh, sort of lived in the Silicon Valley, I don't know how many countries, you know what a happiness index is. So, so what, what have been your observations? For me, it's a, I've had a wonderful life uh, as a foreign service officer, a di diplomat. Uh, and over the 30 plus years that I've been in the business, I've seen a lot of changes. And I've seen a lot of changes in Canada. And I think I should just kind of position Canada relative to India. But we're the second largest country in the world geographically. Uh, and we have a population of 33 million people. So, uh, you know, big country, not a very large population. We have 25% uh, of the world's uh, freshwater resources, uh, you know, in incredible land mass, very, very productive, tr uh, tremendous amount of resources. So as a country, we're pretty, uh, we're pretty well off. We, you know, we manage ourselves well, good economy, uh, and the such like. And of course, when you benchmark that against India, I mean, my goodness gracious me, India is a, a billion plus people, uh, you know, a, a whole set of different problems than we would understand. But one of the challenges as, as a Canadian, uh, I think, is understanding the issue around entrepreneurship. Because we've been so, um, I said, you know, so privileged to have, to have so many resources, we don't know what it's really like to struggle. So when you talk about hunger, I mean, it's not something that Canadians would understand, even though we do have, uh, you know, so, social problems in our country. I'm not saying we don't. Uh, and over the course of my career, I've seen a real change in the attitude uh, of Canadian business. Uh, which was one which was very risk adverse, very conservative, uh, a, a, you know, a, a country that would you know, take a very slow and deliberate approach to things, uh, and particularly when it comes to the people doing business. Uh, Canadians were great at running big businesses, uh, not so good at becoming entrepreneurs. And so uh, what I've seen, uh, particularly in the last five to ten years of my career, uh, and, uh, and Desh and I had this conversation about the role of immigrants in our society, uh, you know, we have 4% uh, of our population uh, is, uh, or originates from India, and it's about the same originates from China. They're dy very dynamic individuals, much more different in terms of their risk profile, in terms of what they do, and are much more enthusiastic about going out and making things happen. So we see a much more entrepreneurially driven society, more and more so, and it's about how you bring uh, economic development down to the, to, the, to the lowest level and getting people enthusiastic about going out and starting it on their own and that they can take the risk, they can fail and then pick themselves up and succeed again. And it's about, uh, just to, uh, to, to uh, repeat what Mohan said, he, he called it a dream, I call it a vision. What's your vision? What do you want to be able to do? And then marshalling resources the, to accomplish that vision. And a lot of those resources, I mean, Yes, it's financial, you have to have some money to be able to do this, but more importantly, you have to have the support. And I think this is what we're building in Canada now, and the reason why we're spending a lot of time here in India in building a bridge between our ecosystem uh, on the entrepreneurial side and the ecosystem that's here in India. Because one of the biggest challenges that Canadians have is understanding scale. When you're a market of 33 million people, 5% of your market maybe is domestic in Canada, 95% of your market is outside the country. And we're, we're used to building things that are expensive to build. We spend a lot of money on research and development. Uh, we don't understand the concept of jugar, right, which is really an Indian concept of frugal innovation. So the, the role that we're trying to do now here in India is to bring Canadian companies into this environment to understand what it takes for two things, to bring the cost of your product or what you're doing down to a level which is going to be uh, marketable globally as opposed to just in countries that can afford it. And the second thing is to understand scale because we just do not see it in our environment. Yes, the United States is next door, it's 300 million people. It's easy to drive across the border. You know, Desh was in uh, uh, New Brunswick and in, and in Ontario. You know, to get to New York, it's an eight hour drive, it's a 45 minute flight. That's an easy market for us, but that's not the market that's gonna be driving us in the future. So we have to have young, entrepreneurs who know how to understand and deal in markets that are a billion people or 250 million people outside of our normal comfort zone. So that's part of what we're trying to do and that's the observation I would make is that this is, this is a great place 
you know, just taking a look at, um, at what I saw this morning and, under, and, and seeing people who understand how to take uh, a, a, you know, this is a, a very important problem to solve. How do you feed all these people and then put the systems in place to make it happen? And that, I think, is inspiring. But it, most importantly, it says to you that it can be done. And that's the most important thing, is that you put the effort in and not be intimidated by what seems to be a big challenge. And uh, you know, I came from the valley to, uh, to India, and we had set up incubators. We, we have a fairly, it, it, it's an evolving incubation system uh, within Canada, where young companies are being built and grown. But to understand how to do business in a global environment, we're putting what we would call technology accelerators. We have them in, uh, in Sunnyvale, San Francisco, Boston, uh, uh, Desh's, understands what's going on there, uh, New York. Uh, and the point is that you have to come, you have to find mentors, you have to understand what needs to be done. And I think a lot of what you were saying is if you wouldn't have been able to succeed without mentors in that process. And so you need to have that type of support base. And uh, again, to understand how a company from Canada can come in, a young company that really doesn't have a lot of resources behind it, has to come here and find the right mentors to help them uh, do what they want to do. And a lot of what they're selling here or what they want to do in India is at a level which benefits the society. Whether it's water, uh, whether it's food and food security, uh, whether it's transportation related, all this is fundamental to what's going to make India succeed going forward. And there's a role for them to play. And, the, and the, uh, a very large role and, and one that we're fo focusing a lot of energy on is education. And it's not about attracting uh, very smart Indian students to Canada to go to university, people like Desh. Yes, we want that. Of course, everybody would like to see that happen. But more importantly, how can we bring Canadian vocational institutions to India to skill here? Because that's critical. You know, when you have 50% of your population in this country under the age of 25, it's fundamental that we come up with ways to upskill these people. So what you're doing here, creating entrepreneurs, is all part of that skill development process, and I think it's fundamental. And how can we help you do that? Well, thank you, thank you. So Deep, um, you know, I know you've, uh, you have a very deep knowledge of this, uh, this sector. You've done a lot of stuff. What, what, do you, what works and what doesn't work? And also, we have a lot of business people here, including everybody here. When they start getting involved with the nonprofit, what mistakes do they make and what value do they add? Well, I mean, let me, let me first, you know, you initially the question that you asked, you know, uh, what matters, how do you, you know, what is important? Um, I retired from Pradhan uh, seven years ago. And since I've been gone, uh, they've doubled in scale and they've done Many more. It's things. because what you set it up, not so, because we left, right? So, so I think you know, I think if you want to go to scale, if you want to make a difference, if you want to have influence, if you want to uh, make a contribution, if you want to change things, you've got to work for your retirement. You know, you, you should be uh, you should uh, have no notions that you are indispensable and and so on and so forth. So if only when you will you work in a way that you would become redundant. Uh, then uh, things work. And not just that, I think, you know, you know, a lot of the times what we tend to do is we throw money at problems. You know, I get upset because somebody is hungry, I get upset because somebody is ill and can't afford the medical care, I see lots of illiterate people, I see a lot of hungry people, poverty, so on and so forth. So if you go to donors, typically, if you go to the donors with a bucket saying that, you know, I'm going to dig three wells, money comes relatively easily. You know, somebody may be more fascinated by education, so if you say, I'm going to teach three kids, they will give you money. Somebody is more fascinated by agriculture. If you say, I'm going to you know, do irrigation, they will give you money, and so on and so forth. But if you go around and say, listen, I want to uh, you know, get people to go and work in development, but I need some resources so that I could train them, or I could you know, pay them a stipend, and so on and so forth, uh, there's no money. Uh, because there's nothing tangible here. You know, how do I know that Naveen is going to do some great work in the field? And 
We don't know where he will do it and, and so on and so forth. So that's one big uh, problem that I think we all um, uh, tend to do because we are moved by problems. We are moved by misery. We are moved by uh, you know, the, the bad things that we see. So we tend to ameliorate what we see, uh, what affects us. And that's, that's, you know, that's all of us do that, not just people who give money, but people who work in the field also do the same thing. Now, when I started uh, way back, in fact, the idea in my head came in way back in 1977, soon after I'd come back from the US with a hotshot MBA and had a master's degree from MIT in engineering and so on and so forth. And I went in, you know, my first assignment uh, from uh, SRI in Pune uh, was to go and look at an NGO. That was the first time I had heard of something called an NGO. And that's the first time I actually had the darshan of an NGO, went to the field in, in Ahmednagar district. Met a doctor couple, uh, Raz Arole and Mabel Arole, both MDs from uh, Johns Hopkins and working in villages, and I particularly remember Mabel, you know, little portly sort of woman sitting on the floor with these Maharashtrian women with their dhotis tucked from the back and, and what have you. Most of them Dalits and dealing, engaging with them, no white jacket, no stethoscope, dealing and engaging with them as if they were her, you know, long lost sisters. So that's where sort of a penny dropped in my head that, you know, if we want to change this country, We've got to have people like the Aroles to go and work in every village, every town, every slum, and so on and so forth. So that's, that's where the inspiration of the idea of Pradhan came, and I didn't immediately jump into it uh, like many people do. Um, but, you know, the, 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 the sort of choice could have been for me to go, and you know, I come from a very remote rural part of India uh, in Uttarakhand, very close to Nepal and, and Tibet. And a lot of poverty there, a lot of misery there. I, the most obvious thing to do for me would have been to go there and, you know, erupt a few villages and set up a small NGO and start doing work in those, uh, those places. But I, you know, engaged with this issue that how do more Deep Joshis or Arolis or, or whatever, uh, or Naveens or Neelams go and do what these people are, are doing. So I, Got into that, you know, Pradhan was set up and started working on it. And within very first three years, we you know, were, were sort of uh, stupid almost. Uh, I remember Vijay and I went to Ford Foundation and said, uh, you know, we need an endowment. He said, well, what do you need an endowment for? They had given us the initial startup support. And Tom Kessinger, who was the rep at that time, Tom and I had worked together. So he sort of, you know, knew me and was fond of me. And uh, uh, we said, well, we want to set up a rural university. He said, yeah, rural university. This is the third year of Pradhan. Um, and where is the faculty? He said, well, you know, the two of us, we are the faculty. We are going to train young people. Because when Pradhan started, we had this dream notion that we will get educated people, professional people to go and work in villages. Because my experience of having visited many NGOs after meeting the doctor couple uh, was that you know, big hearts, a lot of concern, a lot of care, and so on and so forth, but very little knowledge, very little skills, and, and so on and so forth. So I said, yeah, this is what we need to do. So we went around campuses trying to recruit people. First of all, people wouldn't come. If they came, they actually didn't know the back end of a village. Uh, so we said, well, we've got to have a system whereby we will actually systematically get uh, recruit people and you know yeah. educate them, train them in the field and so on and so forth. So that's how this whole kernel of Pradhan, uh, through which uh, you know Neelam and, and uh, uh, her dear husband have been through, uh, set up an apprenticeship program. Initially, our goal was just to have ten people to come every year, and that's how we we started. Um, and I remember a lot of the times people would tell me. Uh, what does Pradhan do? Uh, I remember a dear friend from Seva once asking me, uh, you know, we organize women, uh, so that's what Seva is known for. What do you guys do? Uh, it was a bit complicated to explain to her that what we try to do actually is to bring, you know, people like you and me uh, in larger numbers to go and work in villages, skill them, give them, you know, help them sort out themselves, uh, and that's how we intend to, to grow. So I think, in a way, the investment in uh, 
creating that capability is, is something that, that uh, is important. So it's not just that Deep Joshi can do this or Mondas can do it or Desh can do it or, or what have you, that there is capability in all people, particularly in uh, people working in, in uh, people that we work with, the, the entrepreneurs that you saw in the morning, uh, that to have the faith that everyone has capability and that what is important is to invest in creating generativity, to ensure that, you know, that things will, you know, grow in both horizontal spirals as well as vertical spirals, that the problem I solved today, uh, tomorrow a bigger problem comes, can people deal with that problem on their own so that I become redundant and I can retire and people can actually build and move from one level to the next level to the next level. Similarly, if I have lit a lamp, that lamp can light 10 other lamps. So the communities that we work with can spread happiness and whatever uh, is there to spread. Uh, in a so if you work on both the spirals, the horizontal spiral and the vertical spiral of you know, people having that innate ability, that, that generativity, to be able to you know, deal with problems on their own and to invest in others just as somebody has invested in, uh, in them. I think that to me is, is, uh, is, is right. something that one uh, needs to do. Right. <clears throat> so, so what we have heard is that what matters is not just counting what you're trying to do, but the infrastructure itself, the human resource, the talent that you have within your organizations, because a lot of the times, the NGOs don't quite address the management capability to be able to do those things and scale those things. So that's important. We know thinking globally is important. We know when you get started, you somehow do it by hook or crook. But as you get larger, you do have to count a lot of things to actually get the systems in place because if things go wrong, they go wrong in a big way, right? Great, thank you, thank you. Well, I just want to tell you one little story about this followers and leaders. You know, I and Jayshree, we started a program called the Undergrad Undergraduate Professional Opportunity Program, UPOP, in MIT. And there were, uh, this is almost about six, seven, eight years ago. And there were 200 undergrads who were taking that course. And it was a little bit more of teaching leadership and listening, you know, all this kind of stuff. And so there was this electrical engineering prof, a crazy guy, who said, I'm going to get an experiment so that I can actually tell you who is a leader and who is a follower. So, so he had this experiment and he had this thing where on a table he would sit five people and he would get each one of them to play the role of a follower and a leader. So he tabulated the whole thing and he ran the experiment. What did he find? He found that the best leaders were the best followers. Because leadership also means that you have to be a good listener, right? So, so it, was, uh, it was interesting that uh, good leaders are also good followers because they know how to listen. So with that, I really want to thank the panel here. Give them a big hand. Yeah.